So if you've got negative emotions because you have negative thoughts, the next thing it's going to control is our action. Inspiring you to reach your goals and live your dream. And live your dream. This is the Keaton Nelson Show. All righty, guys. I've got a very, very special treat for you today. Uh, Mr. Chris Patterson. I mean, just go look him up. Check out his YouTube. Check out everything that this guy's up to. It's uh, pretty amazing. So I'm, I'm honored to have you on the show, man. Thanks for coming on. My pleasure, Keaton. Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude. So I always like to start, like, just like, where'd you come from? Yeah, I know you're an immigrant. Uh, I'd love to tell, like, the, the story, like, how'd you grow up? Were you rich, poor, uh, middle class, mom and dad together? Like, what was it like? growing up as young Mr. Chris Patterson? Uh, well, I grew up in Windsor, Ontario. So technically, yes, I'm an immigrant. Uh, came <laughs> from Canada, although I've spoke to real immigrants and they say Canada doesn't count. So <laughs> here I am. I've been, in the, I've been in the United States now for about 28 years, moved here when I was 25. And uh, I grew up in a little motor city called Windsor, Ontario, right across the border from Detroit. So uh, Motor City, because the main uh, the main careers there were Ford, GM and Chrysler's. So I did not grow up in any kind of well, let's say we, we had what we needed. You know what I mean? But sure. it was always tight. It was always tight. It felt like every single week we were trying to uh, roll some more nickels or some more dimes on the carpet to get what we needed. So it was it was a tight upbringing for sure. Gotcha, man. Um, now. How how did you get to, you know, wh- where you are today, man? Like, did you go to college? Did you, you know? So I was that C student that barely passed. And mostly because it was intentionally done that way. I, I really never resonated with school. Um, I had a really difficult time getting through school. I was always trying to find the shortcut. Some might call it cheating. Um, you know, back when I was a young man, it just didn't make sense to me. I was learning all these subjects that I had no interest in. Uh, I didn't feel they were going to benefit me in the future. And honestly, they weren't going to. Uh, but I did learn how to delegate. I learned how to multitask. I, I learned how to uh, get by. And I, what I was really doing is I was grooming to become a CEO. So I've had my company interchanges for 22 years now. I'm very, very happy with the progress that we've had. We started with nothing. And to date, we've generated over $1.6 billion for our clients. I'm very proud of that number because it means we've made a huge difference for not only a lot of companies, but the people in them. So uh, that's kind of where I was to where where I am today. And uh, a lot's happened in between for sure. Yeah, definitely. Did you have any um, like brothers and sisters growing up? I do. I've got. Well, I mean, like now, right? <laughs> but I mean, yeah, two brothers, two brothers, two sisters. I was the oldest uh, and the most rebellious of the five. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's it somehow served me well, though. Gotcha. What did your parents do for work? So my father is a, an attorney, and my mother was a, a high school teacher. So I learned all my negotiating skills, debating with them on a on a regular basis, especially my dad. <laughs> I you bet uh, they were both tough. Uh, both my mom and dad were were uh, very intelligent, well spoken. So I had I had to figure out quick how to fend for myself as I was growing up as a young man, for sure. Mm. What, what what type of rebellious things did you get into? You were the oh rebellious. gosh, Keaton, you gonna go there? Okay, let's do this. Poke so, out a little bit. I like to say by the time I was 25 years old, I was a self-made man. And boy, you should have seen what a mess I made of myself. <laughs> I, was, I, was a, I was a really screwed up kid. Um, you know, my, my parents did go through a divorce when I was about 10 years old. Um, you know, all the ramifications and trauma and things that, that came from that. So I was out on my own uh, by the time I think I was 15 or 16 years old. Uh, mm. Really due to my own choice. I just decided I didn't want anyone telling me what to do anymore. Sure. And uh, 15, 16 out of my own, uh, never really went back, uh, maybe for a couple short stints. But um, I really had to learn how to uh, grow up quickly and somewhat raise myself, so to speak. So I, you know, I got into all the things you shouldn't get into. 
yeah. you know, uh, with, with that kind of freedom, you know, 15, 16 years old, imagine, and uh, a pretty high energy young man. Um, I, uh, you know, I got into drinking and drugs and, and, yeah. and, and women and, you know, everything else that was uh, temporary gratification. I was all about it. So uh, that was fun for a period of time. It was really fun until I really crashed and burned by the time I was 25 years old. I, I remember uh, there was a girl that I, I really wanted to, I thought she was going to be my wife and she left me. Uh, she had good reason to, by the way. Uh, <laughs> she left me and then that sent me into a kind of a spiral downward of depression. Uh, then I lost all my money. Uh, then I lost all my confidence and uh, things really went in the wrong direction quickly. So, um, that'll catch you up to where I was at at 25 years old. Yeah. I, thanks for, for sharing. Uh, and actually I want to like imagine there's someone who's listening to this. They're 25 years old or around that age group. They went through a breakup. They're feeling that way. What, what, uh, what advice would you give to that person? Um, you know, it was so devastating to me at the time. i um, not really the breakup. I just didn't understand depression. I didn't understand the, uh, the negative effects of, of why I was depressed or what was happening to me. The, the reality was, uh, physiologically, I was losing serotonin in my brain. And when your serotonin depletes, it sends your mind into a, just a whirlwind. You know, you really can't function too well. So I went through massive depression. Um, I actually went through it twice. I went once through when I was 25 years old and another time when I was 42, to completely different circumstances. But it was the circumstances that set it off. You know, bad things happen, right? So when bad things happen to me, I just spiraled downward. And my recommendation to anybody that's going through that, whether you're going through a breakup or bankruptcy or a divorce or, or something that's, you know, on the negative side of life, do not give up. And I almost did. I, I really did come this close to just ending it all. Um, it was a very scary period of time. I couldn't fix it. And I kept trying to fix the circumstances. The more I tried to fix those, the worse it got. And uh, I just got so hopeless that I really felt like I was in a place in life where there wasn't a future for me. That's what I, that's what was in my mind, right? So the truth is, there's always a future for you if you just don't give up. There's always going to be a better day if you just keep going. Um, you know, one of the things that kept me going during that period of time, Keaton, was just saying, all right, let me just get through the day. Living 24 hours at a time, you know, one day at a time. It sounds so cliche, but it's true. When you're going through those difficult times, know that things are going to change. Everything changes with time and circumstances, everything, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to kind of hang in there. And eventually, within about a year, I'd say it took me some time, but within about a year, I started to get much better. And then certainly within two years, I was a lot better. And then, you know, I was thriving after that. Um, also, another thing is sometimes it's necessary for us to go through these really challenging times. I, I don't recommend it for growth, <laughs> but, when you're, but when you're going through it, um, I think it's an opportunity for you to really look at it and go, you know what? This is happening for me, not to me. And sometimes it's not even happening for me. It's happening for the new person that I'm becoming and the impact that I can make for other people. For instance, even sharing on this podcast right now, there might be people listening to me right now that I can impact in a very positive way that would have never happened had I not gone through my own pain. Hmm. So, uh, hope, hopefully that helps you answer your question. Uh, do not give up better days are ahead. I love that. Um, I, I had a mental breakdown when I was 21. Actually, I spent the tw my um, 21st birthday in a psych ward. Um, drug induced psychosis. I was a, taking a whole bunch of Adderall and stuff. Terrible, 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 terrible. They thought I might have sch schizophrenia. I was relieved. And my, my mother especially was relieved when, when she found out that it was drug induced because it could be fixed over a period of time and stuff. Um, but when it's I was, scary, it's a scary thing going through. Oh, it, was, it was terrifying. It, it was the scariest thing I've ever been through. Was, Me too. I, yeah. Um, but while I was uh, in the hospital, you know, they have all those things to like, I don't call it coaching, but like, you know, therapy sessions and things like that and group stuff together. And what they said is like, all right, just get through the hour. 
Get through the minute if you need to. Yep. Get through, you know what I mean? Just, what's your goal for today? Don't worry about tomorrow. What's your goal today? It, you know, and then the, that was what, what we did every single day was just like, I, I had to be there for 10 days, just make sure I was okay. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it was, it was terrifying, man. Um, and I think also how you tie it into like how it can be positive and, and impactful for other people. It also gave me like perspective now to see like how good things are. And when bad things, like you said, bad things do happen when they do happen. I can look at it with like, compared to that, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I appreciate you, you sharing that. And um, I hope it does help someone. Um, speaking of which, if you're listening to this and if maybe it helped you or maybe it, you uh you think it could help someone you know is like share this out i mean like if there's an episode to share out is this one with chris patterson man this guy is absolutely amazing um so not to toot your up to your horn too much but like hey, you can I, gas I, me up as much as yeah you I, I look up to this guy quite a bit guys <laughs> I, I really do uh what he's done is like nothing short of amazing i also want to like point out that he didn't talk about how much money his company made when i asked him about like where he was he talked about how much money he made for his clients and i like that just shows the type of guy this guy is so, um, there's a lot you learn from them. So yeah, now I want to talk about kind of like where you are now, man. Sure. Um, and I mean, obviously you had interchanges, totally crushed it and you're still crushing it. You've got, um, your guy, Nelson, who's kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but he's pretty much heading that thing up and making sure the, the, the train's moving. Um, but, but like, tell me what's, uh, what's going on right now for you, for you. So Currently, um, I've got three different verticals, and I'm just trying to stick to those three for now. Uh, I do own a digital marketing agency called Interchanges. Uh, within that agency, we also have another brand, which is called White Label Chats. So we've got a software company. I'm sure if you've gone to a website and see a little box pop up and says, how can we serve you? How can we help you? So those are the chat services, but we manage those. I've got 160 people that work for me all over the globe. Um, that are helping with the software company and the digital marketing agency. And then I've got my executive team all pretty much here in Jacksonville with me. So um, it's taken a long time to get to this place. I'm very grateful now. Uh, I weathered the storm and the blood, sweat and tears of almost two decades of getting through building these companies to the place where they're at now, where I'm hands off. Um, I do check in probably an hour a week. Um, on both of those companies, you know, go through the statistics, meet with the team, uh, try to fix anything that's not not going right. But like you mentioned, I've got Nelson Bruton and another gentleman named Jason Owen and uh, a young lady named Brenda that are all kind of heading up the management of those two companies, which gives me the freedom to do what I love most. And I know you know what that is, which is coaching. So I was mentored uh, by a, a gentleman named Zig Ziglar back in 1997. And for those of you that don't know who Zig was, uh, think think a Tony Robbins, Gary V, whoever it is, Ed Milet, whoever you look up to today, he was that guy in the 80s and 90s for certain. He had impacted over 250 million people in his lifetime without the internet. That's a crazy wild. statistic. Yeah, that's he, wild. He, he spoke in every country. He was just nonstop on planes, trains, and automobiles going to speak and speak and speak. Uh, probably the most impressive individual I ever met. And I had a chance encounter with him, Keaton, which was fun. Uh, first, I would saw him at uh, the Palace of Auburn Hills in Michigan. And I loved it. I loved what he was saying. I bought his cassettes. I listened to him over and over and over again. It gave me kind of a game plan, goal setting. It started to you know, move forward in my life. And then by a chance encounter, I started running all these health clubs all over the United States. And one of those was in Plano, Texas. And one day, one of my staff came in and slid a driver's license across the table and said, I think you're going to want to take this next guest around the club. And I said, who is it? And I looked down and it said Zig Ziglar. So I was in shock because this, this was literally my hero. He still is my hero. He passed away back in 2012. But that, that man changed my life. So... Walked him around the club, sold him a membership, and he said to me, uh, I said, is there anything else I can help you with, Mr. Ziegler? He said, well, I need a personal trainer. So I'm about as sharp as a bowling ball most days, Keaton, but this day the light bulb went off. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, Mr. Ziegler, I've got a deal you can't refuse. He started laughing. He said, what's that? I said, I will personally 
help you three times a week with your physical fitness for free if you'll be willing just to spend one hour a week working on my mental fitness. And he agreed. So I would meet with him at, uh, at his church or we'd go to we'd go to lunch or sometimes to his home. And of course, we we'd met and worked out together, too. So um, incredible. It was one of the most incredible years of learning for me. And it really set me up. I remember seeing him on stage and I remember everything went black. I know it's going to sound a little bit funny, but I remember this. Uh, I saw him on stage speaking and everything went black. And then all of a sudden, almost like I heard an audible voice, audible voice saying, this is what you're going to be doing one day. And now I get to go speak and uh, all over and, and share my stories and share about mindset. And uh, it's been such a privilege to be able to uh, kind of walk in his footsteps. I actually became a Ziegler Legacy Certified Coach, Speaker and Trainer back in 2015, uh, his son, Tom Ziegler called me and said, how would you like to carry on dad's legacy? So uh, unbelievable privilege. And certainly my passion project in life is just helping people get from where they're at today to where they want to be in the future. And I show them how to be, do and have and get everything that they want. So that's where I'm at so far today. Yeah, that's cool, man. Uh, what's What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew maybe back when you're 25, 27, 28? Let's say 28. That's my age. What's one, what's one thing you know now you wish you knew when you're 28? Hmm. Great question. And I really don't even have to think about it too much. Looking back at it, um, because I had you know, the depression, because I had massive anxiety, uh, sometimes anger because of the past, I didn't realize you can actually control your mind. And too often, I would say the majority of people, the typical masses don't really check into what they're thinking about. And it and they're being led around by their own mind in a very toxic way. And that was me. That was me for for many, many years. So knowing that you can actually capture your thoughts, stop those thoughts, and retrain those thoughts to be positive rather than negative is probably one of the most important things that I could possibly recommend to people is really get control of your thought life. 99% of people have what's called typical masses thinking. And what that looks like is they have the same thoughts that they had yesterday as they had maybe a week ago, as they had a year ago, as they had sometimes even 10 years ago. Those same thoughts control our emotions. So if you've got negative emotions because you have negative thoughts, the next thing it's going to control is our action. And if we have negative thoughts, negative emotions, guess what? Our actions aren't going to be all that great either, are they? And then it's our actions that control our results ultimately. So we have to get a grip of what we're thinking about and how we can control it so it can serve us so that we can get the results that we want in life. So I actually teach a program called Thinking Into Results, where we teach people how to think like the 1%. So who are the 1%? Well, look around and see somebody with massive results. And they have 1% thinking. Uh, Ed Milet's a good friend of mine. Ed Milet has 1% thinking, I promise you. I've interviewed Grant Cardone. I've sat with him, uh, been in his helicopter, gone golfing with him. <laughs> he has 1% thinking. Um, the crazy thing is, we actually have the ability to think the same way if we can go from a state of ignorance to a state of knowledge. And that's what, he, that's what we're teaching throughout my programs. Yeah. I wish I knew it. Yeah. That's the only thing I hear from anyone who goes through those programs. They just wish they knew it sooner. I do. I, I <laughs> wish somebody would have pulled me aside when I was 12. Yeah, said, right. Let me teach you about your mind, you know, but <laughs> unfortunately they don't teach this stuff in, in high school. Dude, imagine. Uh, fr frankly, it ticks me off. It really, really makes me upset because yeah. there is nothing more important in my opinion than being in control of your thought life. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, that's, that's cool. So what, what's next for you, man? Where, where did, what are your goals? Where do you want to go? So I've got some pretty ambitious goals. Um, 
I guess I'll share it with your audience. So I'm I'm currently in process of bringing one of my one of my companies to 21 million a year. Chris, how are you going to do that? I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, you do. However, however uh, because we set a worthy ideal, because we set a big goal, and that's another problem that I think people have is they set goals that aren't exciting, they don't scare, they're not that scary, and they fizzle. They fizzle and die almost every time. But if you set a huge goal, uh, we call it a C-type goal, uh, you when you can set a massive goal and then start to internalize it from fantasy into a theory, and then eventually from theory into a fact, man, is it an exciting life. So yeah, we want to get to $21 million a year. And uh, again, even though we don't know specifically how to do it, we are having meetings around the topic on a regular basis. Uh, we are doing a lot of research to find out what we can do differently to make it a reality. We're having communication and conversations with like-minded thought leaders that are giving us advice and helping us. So again, as soon as you can throw out that large, huge, worthy ideal, the fantasy, your mind automatically starts going, okay, I don't know how to get there, but ideas start to come to you. That positive energy starts to come to you and you start to think a little bit differently as soon as you have that worthy ideal. So that's where we're headed with, with one of my companies. Uh, as far as my coaching program, I, I want to reach thousands and thousands of people. I want to teach as many people as I possibly can uh, how to really live the life of your dreams. And it, it's, 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 it almost sounds like a lie when you hear that, you know, depending on where you're at in life. Right. You know what I mean, I, I know if somebody would have told me that when I was going through my depression, I'd be like, ah, I can't even get out of bed in the morning. I'm going to live the life of my dreams now. Right. But the truth is there absolutely is knowledge and information out there that can change the trajectory of your, your life dramatically. Yes, it can. Um, so I, when you were talking about the goal and how you don't know how to get there and you say like it, it, things start happening as soon as you put it out there, do you think it's kind of like the same thing as the RAS, like the reticular activating system where like you, you buy a car and then all of a sudden you start seeing that car everywhere. Right. And then you, you set a goal and the next thing you know, you start seeing all the things that could help you get to that goal that's exactly what it is so for the audience for those of you that do not know what the reticular activating system is it's a stem of nerves that's right up in the back of your neck and what it does is it serves up information to your brain so if you let's use the analogy that keaton just gave us if you start thinking about a a, a blue suburban a blue suburban a blue suburban well, your reticular activating system goes, oh, okay, it's important to you that you want to buy this blue Suburban. So I'm going to serve that up to you and make you aware. So that's why you drive down the street and all of a sudden you're seeing there's a blue Suburban, there's a blue Suburban, there's a blue Suburban, right? Um, the reticular activating uh, system's job is to serve up information that's important. And we have to program it and tell it what's, what's important. So what's the very easiest way to get your uh, reticular activating system serving up what you want write it down i've got this little goal card and i've got one personal goal and i've got one professional goal hey there he is yeah. see you guys join the winner's circle if you guys want to want to get in the, get in a piece of the good life you got to do what keaton and i are doing that's right so we uh it's easier than you think too <laughs> that's the other well, thing it's amazingly easy isn't it yeah <laughs> we'll just take the step to get there yeah, it's like, oh, you just have to write down your goal on a piece of paper and put it in your wallet, put it in your pocket and look at it a, a bunch of times. <laughs> well, because really what we're doing is we're programming our subconscious mind and telling it what, what we want. Um, the crazy thing about the subconscious mind is it cannot reject information. So if you tell a child he's a bad kid enough, mm. that's going to sink into his subconscious and he's going to believe it. However, if you praise that child and tell that child he can accomplish anything and, and build his self-esteem through the subconscious mind, oh. programming, it's just the ideas and thoughts in our minds, right? Yeah. So um, you, you, you froze for a second on my end. Hold on. I think it's my internet, actually. But um, you said if 
this, this I, I want to make sure my audience hears it. That's why I'm like, I want to have you re-say it because it, um, it's so important for parents out there to hear this. I think uh, it's, I need to remind myself of this more and more often, but you were saying how, if you tell a child enough times as a bad kid, it'll be a bad kid. But if you boost its self-esteem and tell it, it can do anything, it can do X, Y, and Z. I'd love to pass it back to you and have you reiterate that. Cause it's, it's a huge, amazing point. Yeah. Well, the, the point to that is the subconscious mind cannot reject information. So if a kid's being told he's bad enough, he's going to believe he's bad. And it's going to be a very difficult transition for him to get out of that mental thinking. If you tell a kid that he's, he's going to be good enough and he's great and you, you, you're proud of him and you continue to praise him his whole life, well, he's got a huge advantage in life, right? But here's the thing. Whether you've had good programming or bad programming, you can change it. That information was programmed into you if it was negative, and we can program it out of you. Uh, again, it takes a, spe a specialized knowledge to understand how to do it. But once you learn it, it's very effective and it's very simple as long as you have some consistency and discipline to do it. Mm. Yeah. So towards the end of this podcast, I always just have three questions I ask everyone. Um, I'm going to ask you that in a second, but because you're you, I want to add in a couple more. Um, you are like the master of networking, in my opinion. Like, okay. like. He just like goes to the top and makes them his best friends. It's just like so cool. Um, and I would just love to hear like what advice could you give someone to improve their networking skills, how to, to make better connections? I don't like, you know, what I'm getting after here. How do they get to, to help or get in touch with people that like are you had a chance encounter with Zig, but you took an opportunity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like what advice could you give to someone who like to, maybe get a mentorship that they've always dreamed of or, or become friends with someone who, who they thought who they know could help them get to where they want to go in life. Um, gosh, it's part of, it's just personality. Honestly. Um, I, I've, I've been fortunate for some reason, people <laughs> like me generally. And if you don't, that's your problem. <laughs> you don't know what you're missing. Um, <laughs> For the most part, people people like me, and I guess I guess you could say that just means I have a, a healthy confidence, right? So if you've got a healthy confidence, and then you can realize it doesn't matter who the human is, they're just regular people. And uh, too often we we build up celebrity like it's such a big deal, right? And you're right. I mean, Michael Chandler is one of my best friends, and uh, but I met Michael before he was Michael Chandler, the oh, UFC yeah. superstar, right? Um, so another tip there is just catch people on the way up. Uh, Ed Milet, Michael Chandler, um, you know, I, I caught these guys, I, I recognized their potential way before anybody else did. And I would say that's a bit of a gift that I have, is I can see where people's lives are headed before they even see it sometimes. Um, Ed was already a tremendous success before I met him, but he wasn't a tremendous success on the internet like he is now. He was just starting to climb. So I reached out to him and told him I, uh, what I appreciated about him and compliments uh, that were all genuine and sincere. And he responded back and he said, you know what, I think I'd love to do an interview with you. And I start. that's how I got to meet Ed. Uh, Michael Chandler, I reached out to him because I, I saw greatness in him 12 years ago. And uh, we started chatting and next thing you know, he said, yeah, why don't we have a call and let's get to know one another. So I think it's don't be afraid to reach out. If you get rejected, so what? You're back to square one where you started. <laughs> Nothing right. different, That's right? Um, treat people like they're they're regular human beings, just like you and I. And uh, you know, people want rec recognition. People want to be recognized. I'd say it's the number one thing that people lack in life is they just want people to notice them, right? Mm. So when you can reach out and give them compliments and and uh, appreciate their appreciate what they've done in their lives. It goes a long way with somebody that's worked really hard to get there. Hmm. You ever, <laughs> as you're saying this, you ever like recognize that you're an unconscious competent when someone says something like that? You, you, like, as you're saying that, I'm like, man, early in the podcast, I was talking about how much I look up to everything you've done. And it's like, I didn't even mean to do it for any reason, but I'm like, I was like, oh, I was just doing that because 
that's well, that's why I like you, Keaton. Yeah, that's it. Now, now you're now you're consciously competent since I just explained it to you. Yeah, huh? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> they call me the puppy dog, you know, in these networking circles in the mastermind. It's like the master of how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> By the way, I've read that book probably at least at least a half a dozen times. So uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I highly recommend it. That's that's one of the top five books I think you should read for sure. Yeah. I, I also want to point out to maybe some people who aren't like into the whole self-development world or anything yet, but like uh, that book is mislabeled, right? Like you're not like trying to influence people because you want to be in charge of them or you want to like be, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's not a negative it sounds like it sounds negative in a connotation of the world today. I don't know if it was back in the 1920s yeah. or 30s when it was written, but um, give it a shot. Read the first chapter, and if you if you're not won over by then, put the book down. But well, I, you know, I would I think I would I understand what you're saying by the word you know influence. People go, oh, they're salespeople trying to take from me. No, no, no. Um, influence when you have the right character and integrity is a really healthy thing. And for instance, you know, I, I try to influence people every day to work with me because I know what the outcome is going to be for them. Right. Um, the book itself actually teaches you communication skills. It teaches you how to relate to people on their level, the way that they want to be related to. So, uh, certainly not a negative book at all. Uh, in fact, I bet if you read a little bit of it, you'll get hooked and you'll start to realize, man, there's some gaps in my communication game that this book can help me fill in. hundred mm, percent. So that's, it's, it's funny that we got on that topic, but the last three questions, the first of the three is what's one book everyone should read. So since we said that one, what's another one that one book? Everyone oh, should read? She, um, another mentor of mine, uh, as, as yours, I'm sure was Bob Proctor. Yeah. And uh, change your paradigm, change your life. By Bob Proctor. Uh, I, I really think for certain people, certain individuals, especially if you're going through a challenging time, that could be one of the most eye opening books that you could ever read. Um, for business, uh, I know that you know this one too, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. That is an incredible book. Um, this is almost 100 years old, this book. There it is. Bing, bing, ding. You got it. Uh, it's an incredible book. Uh, because it's really a case study more than a book. He interviewed over 500 of the wealthiest, most influential people over 100 years ago, the likes of Andrew Carnegie and you know, the list goes on of Ford, and Roosevelt, and all these other incredible people at the time. And what he did is he, he spent 20 years writing this book and extracting what made them successful and, and influential. So it's, it's just a beautiful case study. And there's like 13 points in there that if you follow these 13 points to a T, it's pretty difficult for you not to end up winning at some point in your life. I, I remember I bought the audiobook and I was, dude, probably the ceiling that I was living in the, the apartment was probably about this high above my head. We were like the smallest, my living room, dining room and kitchen were like one entire room we actually had to walk downstairs to go into the basement for our bedroom and like the smallest kitchen, no counter space. And I'm listening to thinking grow rich and my head is exploding. And I'm like, I like wish that like my fiance Chelsea was listening at that time. I was like, this is amazing. I'm like washing the dishes. I'm like, this, this is the secret. This is it. You know, I just remember the excitement you can feel it in my energy. Now it's, it's un. If you haven't read it, it's, it's really, really cool. Highly, highly recommend. And um, I, I would, I would, uh, as a caveat, I would say this, don't read the book, study the book. Mm. Um, take that book and read it over a year, over and over again, highlight it, underline it, do whatever you have to. But if you can do that over and over and get it deep into your subconscious mind, man, will it serve you and, and do wonders for your life and your business. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, the, the name of it was supposed to be, I remember Napoleon Hill saying it, but I, I, I uh, forgot. R remind me. Um, so 
it was a week before they they needed to get a name to publish it, right? And the publisher was like, if you don't get us a name, we're going to name it. Use your noodle to get the caboodle. <laughs> well, it's cute. <laughs> that, would, that would be a cute child child book. Use your noodle to get your caboodle. Yeah. Use your head to get the money. Think and grow rich. <laughs> Doctor Zeus would have loved that title, I'm sure. Right, uh, but that doesn't that doesn't work for business folks, I don't think. So yeah, Think and Grow Rich was a much much better idea. Yeah, <laughs> use your noodle to fix your caboodle. That's awesome. Yep. So um, the next question. This one's a good one. Um, you got to go back to any age, right? I might have, I feel like I might have asked you this before. So if I have, forget about it. But you got to go, go back to any age. Um, but when you get there, like, you know, it's your older self. You're, you know, it's you. And um, when you get there, you can only say three sentences, right? So what age would you go back to? What are the three sentences you would tell yourself? And I'm, I'm kind of really strict on the podcast. I'm like, just say the three sentences. Don't go in between about why or anything like that. I'd rather just say the three. And then if you want to explain afterwards, go ahead and say why. Sure. Um, I would go back to my most desperate time. And that was when I was 24, 25 years old. That was honestly the hardest year of my entire life. Nothing compares to it. Don't give up. Better days are ahead. You are more than you think you are. Hmm. Those would be the three. Um, I better write those down because I'm going to forget them, but don't give up. <laughs> There's better days ahead. And you're more than you think you are. Oh. Uh, because I was so desperate and because I was in such a bad place, you know, I truly almost did give up. And, uh, you know, reiterating back to anybody that's out there going through a hard time, uh, you know, paycheck to paycheck or even worse, you know, all, all of these different challenges, just don't give up. Don't give up. Life will turn to your advantage if you don't. Uh, what was the second one I wrote? What was the second one I was going to say? I told you I'd forget. Don't yeah, I know. Uh, there's better days ahead. Yep. Gosh. Um, I mean, uh, let's just let's just be practical. If I would have ended my life at 25, which I was seriously contemplating, I would never have met my wife. I would have never had three beautiful children. I would have never created these three different company brands that I have and I'm so proud of and we're making such a huge difference for so many people. Um, I would have never had all the joy and the peace and uh, the financial prosperity and the time freedom uh, if I just gave it all up. I had such a beautiful world ahead of me, but that's the crazy thing about life is we can't see it. So what we need is hope. Uh, the two things human beings need more than anything else in life is hope and encouragement. So sometimes we need to give ourselves hope. And sometimes we need to encourage ourselves, even if we don't feel like it's appropriate, even if we don't feel like we should, even if don't we don't feel like uh, we're in a place where giving ourselves encouragement makes sense. Open encouragement is what it's all about to keep going. What was my last one, Keaton? Oh my God. I'm, I'm doing this thing where someone taught me, they're like, listen to listen, don't listen to respond. So I'm like, <laughs> don't even think about what you're going to say next Keaton. But no, what was the I got, last thing? I got it. You're better, you're better it. than you think you are. Yep. Um, because I was in such a depressed state, um, my self-esteem was in the toilet. You know, and I, I'd like to think now I've got a really healthy self-esteem. But you know what? What needed to be pounded out of me was my selfishness. I was a very selfish young man. I didn't care about other people. All I cared about was myself. And that actually contributed to my depression. So, you know, when you come out of it and all of a sudden your heart is different. My heart was more compassionate. I listened to people probably for the first time in my life without thinking about my own life. And uh, as I did... I became a better person because of the trauma I went through. I became a gentler, kinder, more loving individual. And uh, knowing that, um, I was better than I thought I could be. Mm -hmm. And year over year over year, I've just tried to improve 
uh, the type of father that I can be to my kids, the type of husband I can be to my wife, the type of uh, boss I can be to my employees. So I was better than I thought I was, but it took time for it all to come together and to work. You know, I, I had to get lots of mentoring and coaching and things like that myself, but I highly recommend you do too if you're in a tough spot in life. Hmm. Yeah, I like the better days ahead one. It's so it's really, really cool to think about how many people you got to impact and how many those how many people those people get to impact. 160 employees. That means you're you're providing for them and their families. Or like you, actually, I always like to point this back. It's actually your clients are providing for them and their families, you know. You just happen to be a medium through it, right? Yeah. Um, and you get to serve your clients through them. It, it's it's really amazing. Then your then your kids, right? Three daughters. Think about how many all, all of their friends and and the way they grew up. Now they get to impact. It, it's it's amazing. Your wife, and your, don't forget the doggies. I just got a puppy, by the way. I got I got three Frenchies now. Uh, what, kind of, <laughs> what kind of puppy did you get? We got a golden doodle. Oh yeah, you're yeah. gonna have lots of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun, man. Love love but, me some dogs. I've I've been a I've been a dog fan since I was a little kid. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So in um, just watching the time, I want to respect your time and respect mine as well. I, I got another call after this, but um, so last question. Uh, wh what do you think your biggest regret in life is? And I want you to be honest, but I also want you to answer this question, not from like a negative light, but from like, this could help someone else. Maybe not make us that, whether it's a mistake or have the same regret as you in the future. That's a really tough one for me to answer, Keaton. Uh, honestly, I, I really try not to live in regret. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me change, change the question regarding regret. I would say I'm trying to live a life right now on a regular basis to take chances, to take prudent risks, to do the things that scare me so that when I am 85 years old and sitting in a rocking chair and probably in my diaper, <laughs> there's not going to be anything else for me to do at that point. And I'm very cognizant of, of age and I'm very cognizant of life and death, right? right. So regarding regret i want to make sure that i'm living every single day to the highest capacity that i possibly can so that when i do sit in that rocking chair one day i can look back and be pleased with my performance pleased with uh the bravery the courage that it took for me to live the life that i i decided to live so it's hard for me to go man there's something i regret from the past because i've kind of forgiven myself for all that stuff yeah but using that word for the future is easier for me to explain if that makes sense. Yeah. Normally um, I get like, I don't want to say sometimes it's a cop out sometimes, not all the time uh, for, for people, but I'm the way that you um, talked about it is the reason I asked the question in the first place. Right. Um, because I, I think about it a lot especially when it comes to work-life balance in my kids and my family and in serving my clients at the same time, like um, what am I going to care about really when it comes down to it? You know, when I'm on my deathbed or, or like you said, in my rocking chair, my diaper or something, you know, um, because I don't, I don't want to look back and, and be like, man, I wish I did this or I, I wish I didn't stay, you know, and work on the weekend and, and went to my daughter's soccer game or whatever it happened to be, you know, um, it's just, it's always on the top of my mind too. So I'm glad that you answered the question like that. And I tell you what, um, I don't, I don't always say this, but this conversation is a conversation that I'm glad to, that I had today. Um, I I've been very, very busy and overworked the past few weeks. And, and a lot of things you said really spoke to me and I, and, uh, I just want to thank you for that. And I hope that the listeners uh, got something out of it too. Uh, so just, to wrap it up, just thank you so much for being on the show and taking the time to have this conversation with me, Chris. My my pleasure, my friend. And uh, if anybody would like to continue the conversation with me, jump on at Coach Chris Patterson. I think Keaton's got me all over the place, YouTube and Facebook. <laughs> Everywhere. And, uh, Instagram. So just look up at Co Coach Chris Patterson. You'll find me. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll link you. it up everywhere too for this episode. So if you're listening, well, you'll be able to find it. Well, thank, thank you so much, Keaton, for uh, an opportunity to share on your show. I'm, uh, you, you've gassed me up, but it's my turn. 
you are you are an up and coming. You remember I was saying that I can recognize potential when I see it. You're that guy. Uh, wow. You're going to have a very successful career, and you're going to impact a lot of people's lives. And I'm grateful to to be in your sphere of influence as well. So thank you. Oh man, you have no idea. That means so much to me. So thank you, Chris, and uh, have a great rest of your day, guys. Share this one out. <laughs> I wanted this all over the place. Talk to you later. All right. God bless you.